Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of 980 Know It All podcast. I am your host, Josh. I'm excited today as we get to have another new guest. We've had some great guests so far. I've been really, really pumped with what we've had content wise. And today we're going to have Kyle Treadway. He's an assistant coach for uh, Pacific University, the Boxers. And I'm excited to talk with him. I've actually never met Kyle, just saw uh, he was doing stuff on there and uh, really excited to. I just take a few moments to talk with him about, about baseball and what's going on. So, Kyle, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing pretty good. And so, obviously, Kyle, right now we're all kind of, you know, kind of bored. I mean, right now in baseball, we're usually out there practicing, out there at games nonstop. What things are you doing to help you get through this time and help you uh, just kind of get better as a coach? Yeah, Um I think when this all kind of took place, uh, we all were kind of searching for a new routine. I think uh, as baseball people, we're all uh, very routine oriented. And so uh, I've started uh, doing some more research. I mean, I typically do a lot of like research and reading during the off season, um, but never really in March and April. Um, So um, it's been fun to start breaking into some, I just started, uh, I'm almost finished with the MVP machine, which is something I've been wanting to read for quite a while. Um, and then I spent a decent amount of time uh, on like driveline plus, uh, which is an awesome resources for coaches and players out there uh, who kind of align themselves with some driveline theories and things like that. And then um, also spent a decent amount of time on like fan graphs and baseball savant kind of breaking down what uh, some of the guys are doing at the highest level in the game and, you know, what we can um, take from that and use at our level. Um, and then, yeah, just talking with a lot of coaches, I think, uh, uh, you know, making relationships over the recruiting trail over the last uh, you know, five years uh, has been awesome. And, and uh, you know, picking as many coaches' brains as possible is, has always been a good resource for me, but it's something I've been diving into a little more lately. And uh, also, to be honest, I've been playing a lot of MLB of the show. So, uh, you know, passing the time with some video games here and there and uh, spending time with family and things like that. So. Yeah, no, uh, definitely MLB, the show has been kind of uh, the main staple of a lot of guys right now. And then, you know, I've seen, you know, in the past, you always see coaches interact at games or at the conventions, that type of stuff. But really the last two weeks, it's been really crazy and positive the way that coaches and players are interacting and sharing things. I mean, for me as a fan, it's been really informative to see what's going on. So it's got to be really nice as a coach and even for your players to see this stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, you've seen it all over Twitter lately in terms of hitting and pitching coaches all over the place, exchanging ideas and and talking about the game. And um, sometimes uh, it can get a little contentious, uh, but most of the time it's positive and and just a a good source of information sharing. But yeah, it's it's been fun to kind of see the community come together during this time and try to help everybody get better and kind of keep that baseball fix going through this tough time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, you are a coach right now at Pacific University. So what things are you encouraging your players to do during this time and kind of keep them focused and and motivated for, you know, whether it be summer or next fall? Yeah, absolutely. Um, We have a really awesome strength guy in Race Hauser um, who's been kind of prescribing some in-home workouts for our guys. Um, And so they've kind of have like a five day in home workout routine they've been doing to stay busy and keeping themselves in shape during this time. But uh, other than that, I I think our head coach does a really good job running our social media and uh, he's been kind of encouraging, encouraging our guys to, to send videos and he's been putting together some videos on his own of our guys doing things and and, uh, kind of getting fun with some of the workouts they've been doing. Uh, One of our guys was squatting a basketball hoop, which was kind of funny to see. And, uh, yeah, things like that, just kind of keeping everybody connected on that end. Um, from a pitching coach perspective, uh, I've been having a lot more text conversations with individual pitchers about their development. Um, some guys are able to do a little more right now from home than others. Um, and those guys who are able to do a little more remote training because we are still technically in season, um, you know, I'm able to have more pointed conversations with them about what they're doing as a part of their de- development and, um, you know, kind of tailoring that individually to each guys. And then a part of, you know, the reading and research, you know, you, you occasionally have ideas that you want to share with your players. And um, so whenever I have like a, a, maybe like a pitch design thought or anything mechanically that, that runs through my mind with a guy, uh, I'll either FaceTime or, or text him or call him and 
uh, we'll kind of talk it through and, and try to give them as many visuals as I can from home. But um, yeah, just kind of trying to keep that consistent line of communication, making sure guys are staying active, uh, making sure they're staying healthy and safe and, and everybody in their family as well. So. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously to be a coach at the college level, it, it's not something you just walk into by, by chance, you know, it takes time, takes effort. What is some of your, your baseball history is some of the stuff that really helped you develop um, to where you are now? Yeah. Um, well, I played four years at Pacific actually. I grew up in Southern Oregon. I uh, went to a little high school, uh, Phoenix high school down in Southern Oregon and um, wasn't recruited a lot for baseball at a high school. Um, really was recruited more for football, but mostly by small schools and uh, Pacific really drew me, drew me in with, uh, you know, it's a very unique uh, campus community in that uh, it's very athletically driven. And on top of that, it is uh, also right around 20% Hawaiian based students, um, which was really cool. Like that difference in culture and, and something I'd never really experienced really drew me in. Um, and so I, I played four years at Pacific. And so, uh, you know, my junior year, I think uh, coach Bradley before he was uh, before he had to, to retire, uh, and Coach Rasmussen at the time, who was the, the full-time assistant, both asked me to be a coach uh, on staff after my senior year, which I, I, I've, I've been coaching my entire life from when I was, you know, in seventh grade, I coached uh, you know, Little League Baseball as a middle schooler. And then my senior project in high school was coaching eighth grade basketball. So I, I'd always inspired to be coaching. And I actually got a minor in coaching at Pacific. Um, so, I mean, coaching has always been a passion of mine. So when they, they asked me to, to be on staff, I said, absolutely. And then uh, with the new head coach and Brian Billings, and who is now my uh, head coach at Pacific, um, you know, he, he agreed and, and allowed me to stay on. And um, so, yeah, I, I think through my playing experience at Pacific and, and I you know, had some success as a player and I had always had uh, individual conversations with my teammates about how they could, um, you know, be better, little things they could do, um, you know, try to share what I did to be successful and things like that. Um, I think our coaching staff saw that and uh, kind of wanted me to to continue on as an official coach at that point. So. Yeah, and definitely, you know, for players, there's a certain mindset that players have, but for those who coach, you know that there's similarities, but there's also differences between playing and coaching. So what are some things mindset-wise that you've had to adjust and things that maybe came easier than, than you thought it would when you turned into that coaching role? Yeah, well, first off, when I got done playing, um, you know, you're coaching your friends. That was really a – uh, at times it can be tough, but at times it also worked to my advantage because they, uh, they had the opportunity to see me compete and understood what I was about as a player. So, uh, they kind of respected me on that end, but at the same time, you know, with those personal relationships off the field, you know, it can be a tough balance. So I think at first balancing that w was difficult and trying to have tough conversations with your friends is always, is always the hard part. Um, and I think as any young coach, when you step off the diamond, uh, it's really hard to emotionally disconnect um, from pitch to pitch. And, and um, you know, I, and I, I talked to our, one of our assistants this year, uh, Dustin Meyer, who was our starting second baseman in 2019. He, he came on as our infield coach this year. And I asked him because we were rooming together on our first road trip. And I, I was like, what's harder, being a player or being a coach after our first game? And he said, oh, being a player is way harder. And then our second game, we booted the ball around quite a bit in the infield and we weren't playing great defense. And uh, he came up to me and he's like, Tread, uh, you know, being a coach is way harder. And I laughed because, um, you know, as a coach, you don't really have, you don't have the ability to control what happens out there. And as a player, you have that kind of ownership and, and that control in that, like, I get to control what pitch is thrown here and where I throw it and what that result is. And I can wear that result. Uh, whether it's good or bad. And as a coach, it's a little more hands-off and you kind of have to watch it develop and, and kind of tinker and adjust. And I think that coming into being a new coach, that, that's a really difficult thing to do. And, uh, you know, it's something that I struggle with at first, something I'm doing a lot better at managing now. And, and I actually enjoy that role now because, you know, instead of, you know, freaking out pitch to pitch, you get to adjust and kind of walk players through the, the mental part of the game and, and kind of what they're doing potentially wrong or what they're even doing right and try to reinforce that. And, keep that going so yeah definitely it's I know it's fun when I cover like a lot of the NWAC teams you'll see these young coaches who are they, they remember their days of when I could have done that I could have hit that I could have stole that and and to see them adjust and grow it's really kind of a a fun process to see guys do that and you know obviously for you it, it's one of the things where you started coaching beforehand kind of with your teammates but 
it really mm-hmm. does change a lot when you get that official title. Well, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you, you want to show your guys that you're passionate and you want to be excited for them. And you also, uh, sometimes that'll bleed into frustration. And I think, uh, as a coach and as a leader, uh, regardless of, of what you're doing, I think, uh, a tough thing about being that you understand what your body language looks like and how that's coming over to your players. And I think as a young coach, that can be difficult. And even now, I mean, I'm still a young guy. I, you know, I think I'm in coming into like year five or six years as an assistant coach, but um, you know, I still struggle with that a little bit every now and then in terms of understanding how my uh, body language plays over to my players and uh, how that passion can be conveyed in ways that are positive uh, and constructive rather than at times, uh, a little too frustrated in some things. Uh, but, yeah, I think that's that's always the challenge of being a coach. So, And then, you know, at Pacific University, they're a D3 school. So a lot of people mm-hmm. hear the D1, you know, you get like Oregon State, UCLA, that type of stuff. What is yep. the difference between a D3 and a D1 school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Division three level, obviously, uh, the caliber of player – is a little lower than kind of what you would see at the Pac-12, obviously, or, or any school at the Division One level. Um, but the game, I mean, it's still it's still really good baseball. Um, still played at a high level. Guys still get drafted out of Division Three every single year. Uh, in the NWC, Whitworth, Whitworth, Hugh Smith, uh, he's a six ten right handed pitcher. Was drafted, uh, I think he was the first pick of the sixth round for the Detroit Tigers a few years ago. Um, so there are still really high caliber players uh, in Division Three, and um, I think some of the differences you see specifically from a school standpoint is academics is 100% going to be uh, your main focus at whatever school you attend. Um, you know, at, for us at least, you never miss class for practice, and you never have to uh, adjust your class schedule accordingly to practice. Uh, you, you know, first and foremost, you are a student before an athlete, and at the Division Three level, you know that's very stressed. Um, and that's definitely stressed at Pacific. Um, and then I think there's more of a community aspect of the Division Three level and just being a part of Division Three school. Uh, recruiting is, is very different in that we're a little more year to year with our classes and recruiting rather than Division Ones uh, might be working on three recruiting classes simultaneously. And uh, I think really an advantage of being a Division Three school is first off, you know, kids aren't on scholarship uh, athletically. Uh, the only money they're able to receive is from academics. And so um, there is no hierarchy in terms of who you're supposed to care most about. And I'm not like accusing division one coaches of only caring about their scholarship players, but uh, there, there is a difference in terms of how the scholarship system works uh, at that level. And, and here, you know, there is no bias in terms of uh, who got, who's on scholarship and who's not. Um, but then also, I think you get kids that are very cerebral and are really development focused uh, because they might be missing a tool or two uh, because they might have one really good tool, but they need to develop something. They're very development driven and they are very coachable. Um, so I, I really enjoy working at the D3 level. Uh, I love that it's more relationship and development based and uh, it makes it a really fun experience for me as a young coach. Yeah, and one of the things I've noticed with D3, it almost feels kind of like a, a JUCO type of atmosphere where guys sometimes will feel like, oh, I didn't get recruited the way I thought I would. And they kind of have a an, kind of a little ax to grind, a little chip on their shoulder. Yeah. And it really pushes them. And I love seeing that, especially that level, because there really is talent at the D3 level all the way through. Well, absolutely. And I think when you're looking at 18 to 22 year olds, you really never know who's going to develop when physically. Um, so, you know, a guy maybe at 18 didn't have the tools or the physical, uh, you know, body composition to play at the division one level. Uh, but by the time he turns 2021, 20, you know, he's just as good as any division one athlete. And because he was looked down, maybe out of high school, uh, he has a different work ethic. He has that chip on the shoulder mentality and uh, is way more willing to grind potentially and, and work really hard to be the best version of himself. And, um, yeah, I definitely see that a lot with our, with our guys specifically, but just players at the division three level in general. Yeah. And, you know, I, I th- talked about this a few weeks ago and one of my things is saying, you know, there's talent at every level and a lot of people will look down on D2, D3, but, you know, I've seen guys who have been signed, drafted, like you said, and there really is mm-hmm. guys who are impressive and you, you kind of sit there going, wow, how did the schools miss on these guys? But it wasn't that they missed. It's just that mm-hmm. they weren't ready for that. Well, correct. And I think like, uh, you know, when you're competing at 
the division one level, you know, wins and losses immediately are, are your number one focus. And if a player is not ready to, to help you win now, then it's a little harder to invest in this future. Um, and, and at our level, we, we, you know, we have to see that four-year ceiling. We have to project out and see a guy who's 18 who maybe he's thrown 78 to 82, um, but spins it really well and, and has a lot of room to grow in the weight room, and, and that's evident. And, um, you know, you take a chance on that guy to, to, to help him develop and help him get better. And, you know, by the time he's in his junior year, he might be 86 to 88. He's competing at a really high level in your rotation and, um, you know, might be one of the best pitchers in the conference. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, the Division three level in terms of the recruiting side, especially you have to really project out and, and try to see a guy who wants to develop and is going to develop. So. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, with all the stuff that's been going on, obviously with the lost season and stuff and players mm-hmm. getting eligible back, it kind of, for a lot of teams, it kind of throws off, you know, what's their team going to look like? And, you know, for some schools, it's based on scholarship. But once again, you guys are yeah. all about academics. So how does this affect you guys in terms of your team moving forward? And what are things you guys are having to talk about and figure out? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of guys have – said to us that they are, you know, they're there first for academics. And if they have the opportunity to graduate in four years and get into the workforce, they're going to. And then we've had a handful of guys who want to play baseball as long as they can and and will do anything they can to adjust their academic schedules to make sure that they get that extra year. Um, So it's a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of what we're hearing from guys right now and what they value and what they want to do with their lives. Um, But, yeah, it gives us an opportunity for specifically some JUCO guys who transfer in who sometimes have to maybe play in or maybe be on campus for an extra semester to finish uh, graduation. They have a chance to now do that while still playing baseball, um, which is a really big thing for for some of our JUCO transfers. Um, But other than that, I think it doesn't really change too much in terms of a roster composition. Um, You know, we're we're really strong with our upperclassmen right now, so we're excited to potentially have – uh, some juniors back for, for maybe two more years and even some seniors back for maybe a few more years, but, or for maybe one more year. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a mixed bag. And, and I think it's a little more dependent on, on the individual's goal uh, rather than just kind of anticipating everybody coming back. Cause it's definitely not the case. Yeah, definitely. You guys kind of have a, that D3 level has a little bit different situation and, and it's good. It's good that guys have that option to you know if they're ready for the workforce, go for it. If they want to do a little more schooling, then, I know for me, when I was doing sports, I did better in school because I had that, that mm-hmm. routine. And sure. with, without it, I really struggled. And there's a lot of guys like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think uh, we, we, we have a few guys who, um, who you know, stay um, that fifth extra semester and, and are always around. You know what I mean? Like a, maybe a guy who transferred in or maybe a guy who uh, had a rough semester uh, you know, one of his semesters and is just kind of around the program all fall and wants to be out there for practice and wants to be out there uh, and be a part of things. Um, but, you know, they're just kind of going to school. And, and I think for a lot of these kids, the athlete part of their identity is really big for them. Um, but also, I mean, when we talk about the other side of the coin with the player who wants to graduate in four years and get stuff done, I mean, we had uh, one of our relievers this year, I think led the conference in qualified ERA um, and, and had an awesome season. But he, you know, he would come back if he had the opportunity. But he, um, I think he's got a job with Edward Jones that he starts in June. Um, and he's been hired for, for quite a few months with that. So, um, you know, it's a guy who obviously understands um, what he needs to do for his, for his future. And even though he loves baseball, you know, he has an opportunity at the professional level. And um, he's going to go after it and get it. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Growing up, you know, for a lot of us, we always had that team or that player that we watched that we really kind of just admired in the professional level. Mm -hmm. Is there a team that you cheered for? Is there a player that you followed as well? Yeah, I'm a huge San Francisco Giants fan. I I was born in the Bay Area. Um, My parents met in San Francisco. Um, I would say one of my top five days of my life is my dad brought me home uh, on opening day. Um, I think I was probably in like fourth or fifth grade. And he brought me home and, you know, I knew it was opening day, but, you know, he, you know, your parents don't just take you out of school for no reason most of the time. Um, and back then we only kind of got basic, basic cable games. So if they played on Fox on like a Saturday or something, we got to watch them. Uh, or if they are on like a local Wednesday night channel, we, we were able to see it. But 
Uh, we didn't get to see very many Giants games besides, you know, I used to sit on the computer and kind of follow them as best as I can. And back then the, uh, the game day tracking wasn't as good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember he brought me home from school one day and he uh, brought me back um, to where our TV was in the house and he turned on the TV and he goes, we're going to have a hundred Giants games. I bought the package this year. <laughs> and I was, I just remember being so excited. Um, from like a, a individual player standpoint, I used to skip bedtime to watch Barry Bonds his third and fourth at bats. Um, I remember just being enthralled with, you know, just every single time he came to the plate, um, you know, he, you knew he had an opportunity to hit the ball of the yard. Uh, and, and just the way pitchers pitched around him and feared him and the fact that he had to be so selective as a hitter and still be, uh, you know, potentially the best hitter of all time. And say what you want about, you know, the drug stuff, obviously, but, um, you know, to, to be playing in an era where a lot of people were doing similar things and then also, um, you know, being the best out of all of them and, and then you know, a guy who's being pissed around every single at bat still able to put up those power numbers. It's absolutely insane. Um, so I, I loved watching Barry Bonds. He was my favorite player for sure. Yeah, I was, uh, I was lucky to have that, that Bonds era growing up and also Griffey being here in the Northwest. So seeing those guys, it's just – it's remarkable. And now my goal now, I haven't done it yet, but I want to see Mike Trout play. I have not seen him play there live and he's the one guy I really want to see. Yeah. I love Griffey too, though. I really, I wrote Griffey a leather, I think when I was in second grade, uh, me and my dad went and bought King Griffey jr. On super Nintendo one day and played for hours. I remember that day too. We went to the Walmart when they used to have the uh, super Nintendo co- cartridges in the, in the glass and, I remember them sliding back the door to grab Slug, or I don't think it was Slugfest. I think it was King Griffey Jr. winning run and just being so excited to bring it home and play. And I remember trying to dive over my couches like I was robbing home runs. Um, you know, I wanted to play center field when I first started playing uh, because of Griffey. So you know, I definitely feel that Griffey presence as well. Absolutely. So, you know, right now, obviously, like I said, you've been working with your players, you know, during this downtime. But what advice do you have for like those high school athletes who, you know, miss their spring season and are looking to still improve and maybe get noticed some way, somehow? Uh, I, w- I would say first and foremost, read and research. Um, high school players are lucky enough right now to grow up in an era where information is all over the place and, and readily available. Um, I think depending on what your aspirations are as a player should gear that research. So if you are interested in playing college baseball, uh, I would research as many colleges as possible in terms of what might be a good fit for you. Uh, and then I would try to research like what those fits look like, what each level looks like and why they might be beneficial to you. Why the Juco route might be beneficial to you. Why the D3 route might be beneficial to you. Are you a division one caliber player? Um, you know, and, and what does that look like? And I think, uh, you know, between researching, you know, what schools might look like and, and what each level of play um, and what it means to get there. If you don't feel like you're adequate at that level or, or you're able to get there yet, then, you know, find as much information out about getting better as a player. Again, I think driveline plus is a huge tool. I don't mean to be like a driveline, like a salesman, but I think, uh, if you do identify with some of the processes they're using, I think the driveline plus tool, if you're able to afford it, um, is a great use of your time and, and has an abundance of information, no matter if you're a hitter uh, or a pitcher. Uh, doesn't matter either way. They have, they have really good information on there. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, from like a physical development standpoint, it's tough right now. I mean, a lot of people don't have access to weight rooms. So you're kind of, um, you're not really able to do what you can normally in terms of physical development. Um, so do what you can on that end. Um, I think our biggest limiting factor for young players is, is their ability in the weight room and just not having foundational strength. Um, so, uh, you know, do what you can on that end. Uh, if you do have a catch partner to get ready for summer ball in your quarantine, I would go out and long toss as much as you can. Um, but, you know, other than that, I think uh, reading and researching at this time is a huge, huge opportunity for players. And don't just sit on your Xbox or PS4 and just play all day. Um, you know, hop on your computer, do some research, read some books, uh, do what you can to become uh, more of a well-rounded mental athlete as well. So. Absolutely. And then Kyle, before I go, last question I got for you, and this is something that people have been asking me, what do you do to break in a baseball glove? I mean, what is your strategy? I know everyone does it differently. What is your strategy for breaking in a glove? Yeah. Um, 
well, I, I've had kind of a, uh, a re, um, you know, an evolution in my uh, baseball glove care. Uh, as, a, as a young player, I played in a small town, um, and we didn't really have, like, a whole lot of communication about breaking gloves. So I had, like, a floppy pancake-type glove all through college, really. Um, and I wanted my glove to be loose. I wanted it to, uh, um, you know, feel really light on my hand when I was playing. Uh, and then towards the end of my playing career, I think, uh, you know, I started transitioning more towards like stiffer gloves and, and um, you know, more pre premium leather. Um, so I think depending on how you want, if you want the really loose glove, um, I mean, play as much catch as possible, pound, punch, twist, turn, um, you know, do whatever you can on that end. If you want to keep a stiff glove, I know, uh, you know, if your glove's getting too loose after you break it in, um, one of my college teammates um, would, on road trips, if he felt like his glove was getting too loose, he'd throw it in the, uh, the mini fridge in the hotel um, before games and then break it out. And I know when we were home, when we were roommates in college, he'd put it in the freezer every now and then um, to kind of help stiffen the glove up. So uh, in terms of breaking in a glove, um, you know, sometimes it's a slippery slope in terms of getting it too broken in. So be careful of that. But um, again, just playing as much catch as possible. I know some guys will, will do, if they want to create more of a pocket, uh, they'll put a softball in their glove and then like tie a rubber band around it, squeeze it together. Um, I know that's a good strategy for some guys. So it just kind of depends what position you're playing, what you're trying to do with the glove. But uh, those are some things there, I guess. Awesome. Kyle, well, I appreciate you taking the time to come on to the podcast today. And, uh, you know, once we get going, good luck. And, uh, you know, sure, I'll check out Pacific University at some point. Right on. Excited to see you out. And thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. So, guys, that was Kyle Treadway. He is the assistant coach for, once again, the Pacific University. And, man, it's, that was that was fun. I love these interviews. I love talking baseball, especially with guys that I haven't talked with before. Because uh, you get a whole new perspective. You get a whole new uh, just idea of what is going on at, with different people, different programs. So really appreciate Kyle coming on. That was, once again, that was a lot of fun. This is doing the podcast has been so much fun. I mean, we've had started off really with, with Eddie Smith and then Kyle Crust Angel and then Jay Miller, Ben Harley. And then this, we've got a whole nother set of, of guests all week long, every day this week. So I'm excited guys. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. And once again, I'm Josh, the 90 Know It All. This is the 90 Know It All podcast. And guys, thanks for listening and check you guys on the next podcast. Later.